Okay, let's get rolling here. If I recall correctly, this is the slide we were on. We were getting ready to talk about the pecking order. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Mr. Dexheimer has told us before that he has a sort of memory. He can just remember everything. I assume that's why he has no PowerPoints or anything else to work with. You're just recording it all in your head. Absolutely. Oh, very good. Okay, so let's talk about the pecking order. Remember, up to now, we've been talking about this trade-off. The trade-off between... The trade-off between... Stop it! The trade-off between the uh, expected cost of financial distress and what's the benefit that we're trading off? When you borrow money, you have to pay blank. Interest. And interest gets subtracted out of EBIT before we calculate our taxable income. Therefore, interest reduces taxes. We've talked about this. It's called the tax shield of debt. And the more interest you're paying, the more profits are shielded from the tax man. Okay, now, oh, for shame, he's even later. Okay, you, it's like late day. He was asking for cheat day. It's actually late day. You just didn't get the memo. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a different thought here. And that thought is that maybe firms make their decisions in a different way. And this theory is called the pecking order theory. Do you guys know what a pecking order is, where you do stuff in a certain way? Okay, so uh, for instance, I assume that doing practice is last on your pecking order of things to do. Homework is next to last. Um, napping is probably, what, number two after eating? I, I don't know. But the pecking order is the order in which you do things. And here we're saying when you need, uh, when you need uh, to finance a project, where do you go first? And the pecking order says we use internal funds first. Where do internal funds come from? I'll give you a hint, they're equity. Where? Say again. Oh, very good, retained earnings. And keep in mind when you've got net income and then you pay out dividends, everything that's left over is retained earnings. That money, A, belongs to the shareholder, so B, it is equity, and C, you can use it to fund future expansions. Now, the picking order says we're gonna use that first, and then it says we will use debt next. So picking order is internal equity first, then to use debt, and then finally, last resort, issuing new equity. Using equity, or issuing external equity is your last, absolute last resort. And we'll talk about why that is. Now, we've been talking about this trade-off theory, and we can see right off the bat, the picking order theory doesn't mesh well with the trade-off theory. First of all, there's no target debt to equity ratio. Remember we said in the trade-off theory, there was this perfect point at which the expected cost of financial distress was offset by the tax shield of debt. But in this situation, it doesn't sound like there's anything like that. So that's the first difference. Secondly, uh, the prediction here is that profitable firms will use less debt. And let's talk about that. Remember where internal equity came from. It's money we've made but have not paid out as dividends. Who's going to have more of that? Profitable firms or unprofitable firms? Yeah, profitable firms. And so the pecking order says that if your firm's been making a bunch of money, enough money to fund all the positive MTV projects, you probably won't have any debt at all. And then finally, uh, we have this concept of financial slack. So uh, financial slack. Let's talk about, put it in the very simplest of terms. Think about your checkbook. Are you comfortable writing a check that leaves you like 31 cents in your checking account? Why not? If you have any like 
automatic payment to SOL. Yeah, if you have any sort of things that hit that you weren't expecting, you're out of luck. Also, sadly, about half of you probably can't balance your checkbook. I don't have a checkbook. Oh, you don't keep a balance. Uh, you don't keep a record of your balance. How about that? Yeah, I don't have a balance. Uh, I've got it on my phone. Okay. Now, let's see. So, either way, you've got situations where you could either have the wrong balance that you've got in your head or that things happen. I, and I've had this happen before where uh, suddenly I need to write, so we had storm damage and uh, the people that I hired to clean up, uh, it was $1,700 and they wanted a check. And suddenly I didn't have that kind of money in the checking account. So what's financial slack? It's the money that we've got sitting around to handle these situations. Now under the pecking order theory, uh, you would, use up all of that financial slack before you go out and issue new debt. And we see that just isn't true. It just isn't true. So we kind of do a modification of the pecking order theory and say that we use our internal funds first, leaving enough financial slack to take care of these situations that show up so we're not SOL, right? To use your technical term. If you don't know what that means, ask him later. <laughs> okay, any questions before we talk about what motivates the pecking order theory? Okay, so let's think about this. If a firm <coughs> announces that they are selling stock, it says several things. And this came up last time. Someone asked about it. Is selling stock a bad sign? It was you there, very good. Okay, so here's the deal. If I'm selling stock under the pecking order, it says that number one, I don't have the internal funds. Number two, perhaps no one will loan me the money. Number three, it could say that the stock is overvalued. It could say that the stock is overvalued. So there's lots of bad potential things that come along with issuing stock. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, especially that overvalued one, we're gonna talk about the concept of adverse selection. Did you guys talk about adverse selection in your insurance class, insurance 211? Do you remember what adverse selection is, Mr. McCracken? Um, I think you don't, um, I don't even remember it wrong, but like, you only take people that are like gonna help you with your company. They're not gonna take people. That okay, are. so it's you're getting close. So there is a selection bias in who applies for insurance. So here's the classic adverse selection thing. This morning I woke up and I didn't feel too good, and then I coughed and I had a handful of blood, and I thought. Damn, I may be dying. My wife sees it and says, you need to go to the doctor. And I say, okay, but first I'm going by to see my insurance agent. Why might I go see my insurance agent first? I'll give you a hint. He's got my health insurance and my life insurance. What might I do? I might update my coverage. So, but here's the trick. Adverse selection is driven by something called information asymmetry. I've got more information than the insurance agent, right? And so what I do is I clean myself up and I try really hard not to cough while I'm in his office and I get my health insurance boosted, I get my deductibles lowered, and I also double my life insurance because I am pretty sure this is gonna take me out, right? And the whole time I'm sitting there going, hoping he doesn't notice that I am near death. And as soon as I get done with him and I get all the paperwork, then I go down to the hospital and I finally get treatment. Information asymmetry. Now let's talk about how this fits in with external equity. Think about who knows the most about the value of the stock. Is it the insiders or the outsiders? Insiders. 
Yeah, it's the insiders. And so the insiders are sitting here. The stock is currently selling at $100 a share. If the stock in their minds is actually worth $110 per share, are they willing to issue new stock? Would you sell something for $100 that you thought was worth 110? Heck no! Now, what if you thought the stock was truly worth 90 and it's currently selling at 100? What would you do? Yeah, issue stock all day long. So the information asymmetry between the insiders and the outsiders of the firm drives this adverse selection problem. Do you think the outsiders are stupid? <coughs> No, I mean, there are impulse. There are some outsiders that are stupid, but the market acts as if we're rational because it only takes a few rational players in the market to get the prices where they need to be. So as soon as the firm announces that they're issuing additional stock, what do you think happens to their stock price? Drops. It drops, yeah. Now let's think about this. How are most managers rewarded? Is it a straight salary? Master Tax, however, you're living. Did it rise on the company jet? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. sort of stuff. Mr. Mr. Dexheimer is dreaming of his future CEO job, but this is not, your dream will not become reality. Here's what's going on most of these people are paid with stock grants or stock options. Therefore, what do they want to happen to the stock price? Yeah, they want it to go up. And so they will not, unless they are absolutely desperate or we'll get to uh, some firms that might have to issue equity, but they will not jump on this external equity thing first. They'll use the internal funds of the firm. And in fact, there's an agency theory uh, idea on why you use internal funds before you even turn to debt. And the answer is this, when you take on debt, you are uh, taking on additional monitoring on you. Do you guys know what monitoring is? is any, when you're taking an exam in a classroom, what does the professor do? Don't say read a newspaper. Please don't say that. Watch you, right? Why are they watching you? Make sure you don't cheat. Now, if you are a manager and you've got a pile of money here that you can use without incurring any more monitoring, wouldn't you rather do that than to take on debt that brings new investors that are, guess what, <laughs> gonna monitor you. And so that's why we're seeing these people prefer uh, the internal funds to debt. Now, why doesn't debt have the same adverse selection problem as equity? It all comes down to sharing. If I've got a really great idea, do I want to share the profits? No. By the way, people love to share bad things. Misery loves company. Have you heard that expression? But do they like to share good things? Not really. And so if you're a manager and you've got something really great and your internal funds aren't enough to cover it, you're definitely gonna go with debt if you can because you're not having to share the profits. You're only paying those debt people a fixed amount. They've got no idea how freaking great this thing is you're taking on. But hey, what if you got a real stinker of an idea? Remember we said people like to share bad things? Wouldn't you rather, instead of using internal equity, instead of using debt, wouldn't you rather just issue new shares? And so let's say we issue um, 50%, now we're 50% new shares. Well, hey, they're gonna take half the losses on this crappy idea that we're doing. By the way, why are we doing the crappy idea? To benefit us, the managers, right? Because people are scumbags, right? So that's why we see this pecking order is that's, why, that's what's motivating the pecking order. It's the agency theory, it's adverse selection, it's information asymmetry. Okay, now let's see what's going on here. Uh, in theory, the most profitable firms are going to borrow less, not because they have this lower target 
a debt ratio in their capital structure, but simply because those people have the money for the, the internal funds to go out and do these projects without having to borrow more. And so what this tells us, if people are following the pecking order, you would see people in the same industry and the more profitable firms will have less debt in their capital structure, the less profitable firms will have more debt in their capital structure, and the actual capital structure at the firm will just come about as a combination of the project opportunities that come their way and the previous profits of the firm. That's it. And so it'd be really hard for us to say, oh, an electric utility has a capital structure that's 50% debt and 50% equity, or a bank is 90% debt, 10% equity. We wouldn't be able to see things like that if people truly did follow the pecking order. Questions? Does the pecking order have anything to do with chickens? Hey, if it's a chicken company, very good. That's the only reason, so don't get confused and think there are chickens involved. Okay, so how do firms, actually this is the reality of it. What does the evidence tell us? How do firms uh, establish their capital structure? Well, first of all, we know that corporations have low debt to asset ratios. Now, what do we mean here? What, how do we define low? If you think back to Modigliani and Miller, Proposition 2 with taxes, what prediction would it make about the level of debt at firms? Would it be really low or really high? That's going to be really high because we know the value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm plus the tax rate times the amount of debt. So if you want to crank up the value of that levered firm, all you've got to do is go out and borrow more money, right? But compared to that concept, what we see out there is actually these lower debt to asset ratios, which is consistent with the trade-off theory. Um, we see that the changes in financial leverage affect firm value. And so if a firm uh, takes on additional debt, the market actually views that as positive. And you can think back to why one would think that that was a positive signal they're not wanting to share the fruits of this new expansion with new shareholders. They're going to want to do it through debt. We also see that it's um, consistent with Modigliani and Miller and taxes. And so the more debt you have, the more value you have. So at this point, both the pecking order and the target adjustment theory, or, or sorry, Modigliani and Miller, are going to predict that the more debt you have, the more the firm is worth. So we can't use this finding of a bump in the share price when people take on more debt. We can't use it as evidence to prove either one of those things because it's consistent with both. So another thing, we talked about signaling. What do we say about debt and signaling? Shows that the firm can support it. Yeah, so keep in mind that debt is a fixed form, a fixed payment form of financing, right? And so if you are taking on additional debt, what it means is you are confident that your cash flows are going to be more than enough to cover that increased level of debt. Think about this, when you uh, get out of here, maybe you decide to buy a house. Why are you able to buy the house? because you can afford those higher debt payments because you've got higher cash flows coming in. Anyone from the outside, all they see is you buying the house and what do they assume that must have happened to your cash flows? You're moving from some rat trap apartment into a house with a mortgage. What do they assume happened to your cash flows? Increase. Yeah, it must have gone up. And so this is why we think that issuing debt at the firm is also a credible signal that the managers think that the cash flows are high enough to sustain those debt payments. Now, what if you're a weak firm and you're trying to, to simulate that signal? You go out and take on a bunch of debt. What's going to happen? Bankrupt. 
yeah, you're gonna go bankrupt. So you might be able to signal in the short run, but in the long run, you can't do that. And I see these people that go out and buy the big house and I, I lean over to my wife, I'm like, how the hell did they afford that? And before long, there's a foreclosure sign on the door and the answer was they couldn't. So they, they originally may have succeeded with the signal, but the signal didn't last. Now, what does that mean for people? Do, are most people and most companies then smart enough to say, Shh, I shouldn't try that if, because I know what's gonna happen, right? And so that's why most of the time we see when the debt goes up, we may view that as a credible signal. Now we've got three things that our evidence is consistent with. And so it is entirely impossible for us to use this piece of evidence to distinguish between those three possibilities. <coughs> We do see something here that leads us toward the static trade-off theory and that there are different differences in capital structures across industries. There are differences in capital structures across industries. And we've talked about this before. If you're a bank, you're running on 90% debt. If you're an electric utility, you're probably running on 50% debt. What if you're a biotech firm? zero percent debt because your cash flows actually are negative, right? So the way the biotech firm works is they go out and they raise a bunch of equity capital, probably from venture capitalists. And then they sit there and spend that money trying to come up with some miracle cure. And so the cash flows are all negative right up until what happens? Billion dollars. For, and, and where did they get the billion dollars? What happened to the company? They found the miracle drug. Yeah, they found a miracle drug, and now they're able to turn around and sell it to a big pharma place, and they get this big, big, big payment. Now, do you think that really happens for all of them? No. Okay, so would you loan money to these people? <coughs> Absolutely not. They're not going to be able to make those fixed payments, right? Uh, so that's why they always run on equity. And there is evidence that firms behave as if they have a target debt to equity ratio. Remember that target debt to equity ratio is consistent with the trade-off theory that we're balancing these things out. And what is our evidence uh, that they have this target debt to equity ratio? It's the fact that the capital structure at firms is mean reverting. What does mean reverting mean? Mean means average, by the way. And so let's say average reverting. What does it mean? What is to revert? Go back. Yeah, go back to. So if we say something is mean reverting, it means it goes back to the average over time. And so what we see is if the firm has more uh, leverage in its capital structure than average, we can predict that it's going to go down. And if they end up with less leverage in their capital structure than normal, we can expect it to go up. So leverage is mean reverting. And that would be consistent with this idea of the target debt to equity or the target debt ratio. It would not be consistent with the pecking order. It would not be consistent with the pecking order. Okay, any questions? So what are the factors in the target debt to equity ratio? Well, first of all, taxes. We know interest is taxable, but what if you don't have any profit to shield from taxes? Would you be interested in having debt? No, from a tax perspective, no. And so what we see is the more profit a firm has from the tax shield perspective, the more they should be interested in having debt in their capital structure. Then we talk about the types of assets. So I want you to think about two different types of assets. Let's talk about um, a high rise building versus a bunch of patents. So the high rise building is what we would call a tangible asset and the patents would be intangible assets. Now, assume bankruptcy, bankruptcy for the two firms that have these assets. Which one of them are you more likely to be able to sell the assets for their full value? Yeah, the building. And so if you've got 
solid collateral in the form of tangible assets, you are more likely to depend on debt. You're gonna have a higher level of debt because the debt isn't as costly to you because the people who are loaning you money know they'll likely get their money back even if you go belly up. As opposed to, let's say, the patents. Think about Apple. Apple's got a boatload of patents. If Apple went belly up, do you think someone could take Apple's patents and make the same amount of financial magic out of them that Apple does? No. And in fact, what if a bunch of different people bought, you know, I'm gonna buy two patents, you buy one patent. It's even worse, right? When they're not all in the hands of someone that can use them to do whatever Apple's intending to do. And so the type of assets, the more tangible the assets are, the more debt we see in the capital structure. Then we have the uncertainty of operating income. I have drawn two firms up here. And these firms have exactly the same operating in income. We're gonna call it cash flow here. It's a cash flow bar. So that's the average. Now, the green line represents the cash flow at the firms. Which one of those firms, the one on the left or the one on the right, do you think would be more likely to use debt in its capital structure? The green represents the cash flows of the firm. Which one's gonna be more likely to use debt? Yeah, the one on the left, and here's why. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna see if I've got a red pen in here somewhere. Yeah, we're gonna have to go with blue. Okay, how much debt could this one, in theory, afford? In theory, they could have fixed debt payments that go all the way up to here. If I carry that level on over here, we would have financial distress here, 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 here. Do you see that? And so this firm has to run on a lower level of debt to avoid financial distress. And so the more volatile your operating income or cash flow is, the less debt you will have. Let me say that one more time, just in case you didn't write it down. The more volatile your cash flows are, the less debt you can afford to have in your capital structure. So I'm gonna give you an example from humans. I am a finance professor. I work, I, I've got tenure. I work at a state university, which is a fairly uh, solid kind of thing versus a private school that could go bankrupt, right? And so my CF bar is, uh, could be the same as someone that sells real estate for a living. But my cash flows are not volatile at all. And so I could afford to have a very high level of debt because there's very little chance that my cash flows are going to drop into the region where it would make me unable to make my debt payments. Well, let's think about my neighbor across the street. He's a real estate person. He makes about the same as I do per year. But how much debt can he afford? Well, he really can't afford as much as I am as, as I do because of his uh, higher volatility of his cash flows. Now, if you're smart, you're looking at this and you're thinking, wait a minute, couldn't this person just save money in the, the peaks and use it to fill in in the valleys? The answer is yes, they could. But the question is, do they? Absolutely not. Most Americans do not. And it turns out that companies are kind of the same way. Questions? Okay, now let's talk about the picking order in financial slack. We've already talked about this a bit. Um, so the picking order would theorize that you have no financial slack whatsoever because after all, you're going to use up all your internal funds first before you go out there for debt. We don't see that to be true. And so we make this little modification to the picking order theory. We say, provided that you're keeping in the financial slack, we use the internal funds first, and then we go out and issue debt, and then finally we go out and issue equity. And we know that it's good to have some slack because as, uh, as Mr. Stith pointed out, crap happens, right? 
questions? Okay, so now let's talk about bankruptcy. Uh, we actually have definition, a definition here of business failure. And that is that the business has terminated with a loss to the creditors. Who are the creditors? They are people who have done what? Yeah, the people that have loaned the company money. And if this business ends in any way that stops them from getting all their money back, then we call that a business failure. Now, from the perspective of the owner, if the, you, you, the business dies and the creditors get exactly what they need and there's nothing left over, in your eyes, would it, would it not be a failure at that point? So we're talking about from the creditor's perspective. This idea of defining business failure is from the creditor's perspective, and that is the creditors don't get paid all their money back. Then we have the actual legal bankruptcy. The legal bankruptcy is where the firm uh, files paperwork to either, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, to either liquidate the firm or to reorganize the firm. But the whole idea of legal bankruptcy is to protect you from creditors. Your creditors can keep coming after you right up until you declare bankruptcy. And at that point, they're no longer arguing with you. Now they're dealing with the bankruptcy trustee. That's what protects you from having to interact with your creditors. Let's talk about something called technical insolvency. If you remember, we talked about something called bond covenants. The bond covenants said things like we're going to maintain a certain amount of networking capital. We're going to provide audited financial statements. We will not pay a dividend bigger than a certain proportion of our earnings per share. I could, as a borrower, continue to make the payments on my bond and still be in technical uh, violation of the bond covenants and be technically insolvent because I have violated those covenants. And then finally, we have accounting insolvency, which is where the book value of the equity is negative. How do we get in a situation like that? You got the book value of the assets. Let's assume that the, it's an old company and the assets have all been fully depreciated. The book value of the assets might be zero. And then we've got, if we have any liability whatsoever, then the owner's equity will be negative. Does this necessarily mean that the company is a loser? No, remember the market value of those assets could be pretty significant. We've got factories in this country that are over 100 years old. Do you think they're fully depreciated? They're on the books at zero value, yet you could turn around and sell them for half a million bucks. And so what I'm telling you here is that just because you have accounting insolvency doesn't mean you have actual insolvency. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's talk about the bankruptcy process. First of all, my favorite kind of bankruptcy is liquidation. Now, I look at it from the creditor's standpoint. Liquidation puts an end to the crap. Remember, we got in this situation because the managers made bad decisions. And as long as we leave those managers to where they can continue to make bad decisions, they will continue to burn money. And by the way, that burning of money is going to reduce the amount of money that I'm going to recover uh, eventually as a creditor. And so what I prefer is to see uh, liquidation under Chapter 7 of this Bankruptcy Reform Act. Basically what happens is a trustee, a bankruptcy trustee, takes over the firm. By the way, the trustee is appointed by the federal government. The trustee takes over the firm, they sell the assets, and use the money to pay back the creditors. It puts an end to whatever has been going on at this firm. Now how do they distribute these proceeds, we're going to talk about something called the absolute priority rule. The absolute priority rule is on the next slide. Okay, so that works out pretty well. It puts an end to the problem. 
But there is an issue from that, from that, from a societal standpoint. If the company has 100,000 employees and they do chapter seven liquidation, what happens to the employees? Yeah, they're all out of jobs, right? You've got immediately 100,000 unemployed people added to the unemployed in the country. Uh, from a political perspective, is that desirable? No. From an overall social welfare perspective, is that desirable? No. And so what do we, what do we say that we could do instead? Well, that's where Chapter 11 bankruptcy comes in. And this is reorganization. And basically it allows a restructuring. So you, uh, you have debt of $2 million I, that I owe you $2 million. And what I'm gonna tell you is, if we get a liquidation, you're not gonna get $2 million. You guys know that, right? And you're gonna say, yeah. And then we start to negotiate back and forth. And what the creditors, by joining in the <coughs> negotiation, they're hoping they're getting more money than they would have under liquidation. Now, do we know for sure one way or the other? No, we don't. One of the things that happens sometimes in these reorganization is what is called a debt for equity swap. Can you guess what a debt for equity swap is? Instead of debt holders, you become a shareholder? Yeah, instead of debt holders, you become a shareholder. But here's what I want to know. All right, so we already know that the assets of the firm are worth less than the liabilities. So in order for me to sign on for any debt to equity swap, a couple of things have to happen. Number one, I have to be assured that the firm's current equity holders are totally wiped out, all right? They don't need to have a finger in this new pie. Does that make sense? And the second thing that I wanna do is make sure that I get rid of the loser managers that are currently running the firm. What did the loser managers do? How do I know they're losers? Because they lost. Yeah, they, they drove the firm into bankruptcy. Now, there are firms that have perfectly great managers that go bankrupt because of things that happen. A storm blows the factory away, they didn't have proper insurance or something like that. But if you've got a firm with a good business model that goes bankrupt, a, I would be interested in a debt for equity swap, and B, I want to make darn sure I get rid of those managers. Excellent example here. Do you guys know what a hostess Twinkie is? Yeah, hostess is a bakery, and they actually, they've got their snack cake line, and they've got their bread line. And the managers were so stupid that they signed two different labor contracts for their truck drivers. They had the bread truck drivers and they had the snack cake truck drivers. Now, what does that mean? What if you've got a store that stocks both? By the way, most stores did. How many hostess trucks do you have delivering at that store? Two. What would be the efficient number of trucks to deliver at that grocery store? One. So there's your first thing. The second thing is that they were sitting on this magnificent pile of intellectual property, the, this brand that resonates with anyone that grew up in this country, and they're doing nothing with it. There was no innovation. Their marketing sucked. And so they were doing all sorts of bad things, even though the business itself was a gem. And so what I would do if I were a debt holder in that case, sure, I would be pleased to engage in a debt for equity swap, under two conditions. Number one, we fire the losers that cause this problem. And number two, uh, that we get rid of the current shareholders that they walk away with nothing. And the reason, I, you know, do I wanna share this thing that I'm gonna fix up with those losers? No. And by the way, when you buy shares, you're agreeing to be one of those people that gets nothing if things go wrong, right? That's just the claim. That's why you get higher returns because of the higher risk. Um, I don't. I don't know if I speak for everyone, but I feel like I hear bankruptcy, and some people have this idea that it's good, and like you can get out of a lot of problems with it, uh -huh. and then nothing bad ever comes of it. 
And I don't know where I've heard that from or how that happens, but it's just something I'm still so confused on. Okay, so first of all, if you had a choice of loaning money to someone, would you choose to loan to someone who's been bankrupt or someone who has not? Who has not. Right, okay, so we know it's a signal, right? The question is this, it's a trade-off. There's the damage to your reputation and your credit rating from having gone bankrupt versus what you're able to get out of on the other side. So for instance, we've got this huge talk about student loans right now. Student loans are not dischargeable through bankruptcy. At current, they're not dischargeable at bankruptcy. Let's assume though, that instead of doing student loan debt forgiveness, which by the way, who has to pay for that? The taxpayers, right? Some poor sap making minimum wage at Walmart is paying off this other guy's student debt for getting a master's degree in ballet. Does that sound right? It doesn't sound fair to me. But on with the story. Let's assume that instead of doing that, now we just allow people to discharge their student debt in bankruptcy. That makes the uh, bonus part of the bankruptcy, the good part, much more attractive to these people. The cost over here remains the same. What do you think we would have, what would happen to the number of bankruptcies in this country if we suddenly allowed student debt to be dischargeable through bankruptcy? It could go through the roof. So does that help you understand yeah. how, you know, from the, pers from the perspective of someone who loans money, bankruptcy is always a dirty word, right? From the perspective of someone who is the person who might go bankrupt, there are pros and cons. The con is that I've got to have, I'm going to have this crappy credit rating and I'm going to have this, this reputation. By the way, in my hometown, even if you survived the hit to your credit rating, 10 or 10,000 people, do you think everyone in town knows you went bankrupt? Oh yeah. They're like, yep. And I, I'll even tell you the guy's name because he's dead now. Steve McNew. Steve McNew was a you know, high flyer in my little bitty hometown and then he went bankrupt. And, and, and every time people would see him after that, they're like, Bankruptcy, bankruptcy, right? There's your con. And, uh, but what did he get out of that? Well, he got protection from his creditors and basically all those debts get discharged in bankruptcy. Does he owe that money anymore? No. Questions? Who decides if you're going chapter seven or 11? Uh, I, you file. And most of the time, what do you think companies file and ask for? Chapter seven or chapter 11? Yeah, they ask for chapter 11 because they want to stay in business. Um, sometimes though, things are so crappy that a judge will actually say, nah. right? So can they file for chapter 11 multiple times before they go through chapter seven? Papers? Oh yeah, oh my goodness. Uh, any airline in the United States, go back and look at how many times they've been through chapter 11 bankruptcy. They're, they're like frequent flyers at the bankruptcy court. Good question. Other questions? Does anyone actually pay off the, the creditors like obligate or what they're obligated to? Or do they just Oh yeah. So the majority of companies do not declare bankruptcy. And in fact, even with junk bonds, you're looking at ninety five to ninety six percent of those bonds being paid in full as promised. Junk bonds, right? Junk bonds are from risky companies. And so we spend a lot of time talking about bankruptcy, but it's really a rather small thing compared to the overall economy. That's really how we want it to be. Now, what do you think happens during bad economic times? Yeah, you got more bankruptcy, but during good economic times, you've got companies that suck, that should be driven out of business, but just because there's just so much money floating around, they're able to stay in business. I'll give you some examples. Uh, earlier, uh, like five years ago, what were interest rates like? 2%. Yeah, they're tiny, right? And so you could have a really crappy company and you could be floating it on a mountain of debt. And because the cost of that debt is only 2%, uh, your chances of going, of being, you could probably keep making those payments even though your company kind of sucks. But then when interest rates go up, what happens? Now some of those companies, and, and you might even have some healthy companies that can't survive these higher interest rates, especially if they went to like 15, 20%, you would have some healthy companies that couldn't survive that. 
I'll give you an example of someone else who's been skating on low interest rates. The United States government, right? They've been borrowing money for cheap, cheap, cheap. And we have just blown up the debt, but it's been okay because the interest was low. But what happens when those bonds start to mature? They have to be, but by the way, do you think we have cash to pay that off? Hell no. So what's gonna have to happen? We're gonna have to borrow more money at a higher rate to pay off those existing bonds. Well, guess what? That's gonna eat up at least 75% of the discretionary revenue of the government. Oh yeah, folks, we're in for a world of hurt unless we get our crap together. Hate to be a downer, but you know, that's that's just how the math works out. Questions? So just with the government borrowing money, so if you buy treasury bonds right now, and whenever they mature, you're getting paid off again with more borrowed money. That's oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And uh, just like any Ponzi scheme, <laughs> it always works as long as you can find more investors, right? Does that make sense? And so what if, uh, and by the way, the, the external purchasers of our debt are primarily Japan and China. Have you noticed anything about China's economy lately? You guys probably didn't pay attention. They're in a world of hurt. You think they're gonna have a lot of money to, and, as, and by the way, they're ticked at us, right? So are they gonna be like in a big old hurry to, to help us refinance our debt? Absolutely not. The Japanese, they're, they're kind of a wild card, but they, they're they basically buying as much as the Chinese, so we know we're gonna lose half of that foreign money. And then what happens is the Federal Reserve steps in and buys that debt using, it's basically they're creating money out of thin air. Well, what happens, <coughs> bless you, what happens to prices when you create money out of thin air? Go up. Yeah, inflation. In fact, you guys have lived through it now to know what inflation is and that's how we got it was creating money out of thin air and spending money like crazy on crap that didn't matter questions okay so here is the absolute priority rule and i have to say i was a little surprised at this because the government is down here at number five and I'm fond of saying the government's always first in line, and that's not true at bankruptcy. So who does get paid first? Well, strangely enough, the bankruptcy lawyers. The administrative expenses of the bankruptcy go to uh, the trustee and to the bankruptcy lawyers. Remember last time I told you that lawyers are attracted to bankruptcy like sharks are to blood in the water? That's because they know they're gonna get paid and the pay is good. Now, the wages, salaries, and commissions of the employees. What we're saying here is after the assets are liquidated, if the only thing we can manage to pay off is the lawyers, what do the employees get? Nothing. Okay, well, let's assume we've got enough money to pay off the employees and we've still got some money left. Now we've got the employee benefit plan. So things like the uh, health insurance for the employees, and uh, their pension plans, those would be the next people in line. And then consumer claims. So a while back, um, Peloton, you guys know who Peloton is? They had a bunch of situations where the treadmill was sucking kids under it and killing them. Did you know about that? You guys need to get out more. Okay, so, and, and sadly, people are like putting videos of their ticks getting, kids getting killed on TikTok. LOL. Okay, so, yeah. And so there was, I actually watched this one and I sent it to a, a colleague because he's a lawyer. He actually used to do this kind of work. He's like, you know, I may be a person or uh, one of these lawyers. He says, but I don't need to see shit like that, right? Okay, now, what's my point here? Do you think some people have sued Peloton? Yeah. Do you think Peloton owes them millions of dollars? Yeah. Now, if Peloton went bankrupt, those people would be behind the pension fund or behind the retirement fund, behind the health insurance of the employees in line. There's a chance they wouldn't get anything. And in fact, this is one of the big reasons companies declare bankruptcy. If you go back to asbestos, you guys know about asbestos, it causes the lung troubles, a boatload of 
bankruptcies from asbestos is to get rid of those consumer claims. And then there are uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson with the baby powder. In theory, causes some sort of female cancer. And uh, so what are they doing? Well, they're trying to carve off a piece of their company that contains the baby powder and then have it declare bankruptcy, right? So get rid of those consumer claims. Then finally, we have the government, which just shocked me to death to see that they were behind everyone, behind these other people. And then we have unsecured creditors. Now you're saying, where are the secured creditors? The secured creditors are outside of this process. So if I am a secured creditor, that means that this debt is backed by either a building or a machine or a basket of US treasuries or something like that. And as a secured creditor, I am just allowed to take that, right? And so, because that's the backing for that. Now, in exchange for that security, I was, I was willing to accept a lower interest rate. So, what if, so and actually it's the trustee that takes those assets, sells them, and then pays off the secured creditors. And if they are able to get more out of the item than was owed, the extra money then goes into the big pot. And then the secured, unsecured creditors will get a crack at it. Okay, so the unsecured creditors and then the preferred stockholders. Preferred stockholders, if you don't remember, preferred stock has a stated liquidation value of $100 per share. And before we can give any money to the common stockholders, we have to pay each of those preferred shareholders $100 per share. And if there's any money left, then the common shareholders are the very last in line. My dad's owned shares in four companies that went bankrupt. I own shares in two companies that went bankrupt. Can you guess how much money either one of us saw? Boop. Right? But the lawyer sure did get rich. Question. My wife used to work for the Department of Justice in the Department of the Inspector General. And one of the things that she did was go around and audit these bankruptcy trustees. Why do you think it would be important to audit a bankruptcy trustee? Make sure they're not stolen away the money for themselves. Yeah, make sure they're not skimming. Because after all, here they are, they should be getting as much money as they can for the assets and then they should be paying off the creditors according to this list of rules here. And the only amount of money they take is what they're contracted to get out of this whole thing, right? Do you think it's possible for a bankruptcy trustee if they weren't being monitored to whoop? Absolutely. Questions? So for the trustees, uh, like, in law class right now, we're talking about like your agency relationship, right? Uh, so can they, uh, do they have to act in the best interest of the company in terms of getting the maximum value of the assets or can they just say, oh, as long as we're paid, we don't care? The question is, who is the trustee the agent of? The trustee is not the agent of the company. The trustee is the agent of the bankruptcy court. It's the agent, he's the agent of the government. And so he is supposed to be uh, trying to act in the, the desires of the government, which is to uh, you know, get as much money as you possibly can for this line of people, right? Not for the company itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, in theory, they should be trying to get as much as they possibly can for the assets of the firm, so more of these claimants can be paid off. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay, now let's do some practice. If you guys aren't doing this on your own. Fifteen practice. How many of you have actually started it? Four. Four people have started this thing. Okay, first one I'm going to talk to you about is number 42.
Okay, ATC, can you guys read that? Do I need to make it bigger? Okay. ATC has a value of 98,000 in a normal economy and 87,000 in a recession. The firm has $90,000 of debt. The probability of a recession is 18%. The firm is considering a project that would change firm values to 105,000 in a good economy and 92,000 in a recession. If the firm accepts this project, the firm will blank and shareholder value, the firm value will blank and shareholder value will blank. Okay, first thing I want you to know is anytime you see, when they start talking about the probability of a recession, you know we're gonna to have to do these expected value things. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the state of the economy out here. And they give us what recession is normal. And then they give us a probability. What's the probability for recession? 18%, so it's 0 0.18. Do they give us the probability for normal? Say again? Yeah, how do you calculate it? 1 minus 0.18, so we get 0 0.82. Are you with me so far? Okay, now, um, let's see, the current situation. is that if it's a recession, it's $87,000. And if it's normal, it's $98,000. I've got these swapped on my paper for some reason. Okay, now, by the way, if there's a recession, are the bondholders going to get all their money? How much money do we have? 90,000. If there's a recession, the bondholders are only gonna get $87,000. Do you see that? Okay. Now, here's with the new project. They tell us that the firm value would be 105,000 in a good economy and 92,000 in a recession. Do the bond payers get paid, bond holders get paid this time? Yes. Yeah, so if I were a bond holder, would I be in favor of this new project? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, now we need to figure out expected values for each of these because the first question is, what's gonna happen to the firm value? So how do I do that? I'm gonna take 0.18 times $87,000 plus 0.82 times $98,000. So just in case you guys don't know how to do this on your calculator, I'll do one of them. You can learn from that. So I'm gonna say 0.18 times 87,000 equals plus open parentheses, 0.82 times 98,000, close parentheses, equals, I get $96,020. Is that what you get? And if I do the same thing here, 0.18 times 92,000, 0.82 times 105,000, then I get 102, 660. So the first question has to do with how much does firm value go up? Well, firm value goes from 96020 to 102660. So all I have to do is subtract 96020 from here, and that gives me 6,640. So that is the answer to the first blank. What's going to happen? to firm value. Now, what about shareholder value? Well, let's talk about the shareholder value. Let's, uh, let's go down here and we'll, we'll do, and we'll, we'll flip them because it's freaking me out to have it the other way around. 
So the probabilities, of course, are the same. In the current situation, if it's normal times, what's the value going to be? Well, the firm's worth 98,000. How much debt do they have to pay off? How much? 90. Yeah, 90,000, and it lays on the how much? 8,000, right? Okay, now if there's a recession, they're only going to be worth 87,000, the debt is 90,000. What's the stock worth at that point? <laughs> Nothing, right? And so what we see here is that the expected value is 0.82 times 8,000 plus zero. So 0.82 times 8,000 gives us 6,560. Now the question is, what happens, this is current. And this is with the project over here. In uh, the normal times, it's going to be 105,000. How much money do we owe? 90,000. How much is left over for the shareholders? 15,000. 15, now, in recession, this thing is worth 92,000. How much do we owe? 90,000. So, what's left over? 2,000. And so now what we've got here is 0.82 times 15,000 plus 0.18 times 2,000. And if I got my math correct on this, it was 12,660. And so the second question is what happened to the shareholder value as a result of this project? 12,660 minus 6,000. 560 tells us that this value went up by 6,100. I've got someone on the third row back squinting. Feel free to move forward if you need to. I have Chinese students sit in the very back and they have trouble and I'm like, go get your eyes checked. They're like, no, glasses are expensive. <laughs> like, no, being blind is expensive. What's that? So how did you get the 15,000? How did I get 15,000? Okay. So in normal times, uh, with the new project, the company is going to be worth 105,000, but we're, we owe how much? Okay, I get that now. Yes. Sorry, I had it flipped. I was doing 92 minus the... Minus oh, man. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, and that's partially my fault for going... Right. Okay. Shall we try another one? Yeah. The next one I want to try, let's see, is number 43. Burger Queen has a value of 38,000 in a good economy and 24,000 in a recession. The firm has $25,000 worth of debt, the probability of recession is 50%. The firm is considering a project that would change the firm values of $42,000 in a good economy and $22,000 in a bad or in a recession. Uh, will shareholders accept this project and will the bondholders like this project? So let's do a little erasing here. So what are the states of the economy here? Good in recession. And what are the probabilities? 50. Yeah, they're both 0 0.50, right? Uh, Burger Queen has a value of 38,000 in a good economy and 24,000 in a bad. So let's say that that is the current. And with the new project, 
It would be 42,000 and 22,000. So we can figure out what are the expected values for the firm. So we've got uh, half of 38 is 19,000, and this is 12,000. 19,000 plus 12,000 is 31,000. 38 plus 24 is 62. You can divide by two and get 31,000. Now, what about over here? 21,000 plus 11,000 would be 33,000. Tell me if I get the numbers wrong. Actually, that is wrong, isn't it? Yeah. It should be 32,000. Because that's 64 divided by two. Now, if, uh, are the shareholders in favor of the project? Yes, can anyone tell me why? Is the shareholder value is going up? Yeah, the shareholder value is going up. Keep in mind that either way, uh, they're expecting to pay out $25,000 worth of debt. So the value to the shareholders here is $6,000. The value to the shareholders here is uh, $7,000. And so of course the shareholders are going to be interested in this project. But what about the bondholders? Well, let's see here. In, uh, we're gonna do bondholders now. In the good state, I should say bondholders, right? In the good state, what will the bondholders get? 25,000, they get what's owed them. In the bad state, they get 24,000. You see that? Because that's all the money, because you, you owe them 25, but they're gonna end up with everything as a result. Everything here is 24,000. And we see over here, for the with the project, they're still only gonna get 25,000 in good times, but what are they gonna get in bad times? 22,000. So we got 49,000 here, 49,000 divided by two is what, 24,500? And here we've got 23,500? Is half of that's 12 and a half? Half of that's 11, 12, 23,500? Do you see the bondholders are made $1,000 worse off as a result of the project? I'll go ahead and leave these up here so you guys can come take a look at them after class if you want. Okay. So that is how we answer that one. The shareholders will like it, but the bondholders will not. Okay, number 44. Vaughn Craft Supply expects to generate a cash flow of 83,000 next year if the economy booms and 61,000 if it does not. The probability of a boom is 20%. The firm has debt of $78,000, it's due in one year, and has a current market value of $70,600. The firm plans to close after the coming year. The, the current promised pre-tax return on debt is blank, and the expected pre-tax return on debt is blank. Okay, so, we're being told that the market value of the debt is how much? 70, or no, 70,000. Yeah, 7060, zero, zero, something like that. 70600. Zero, zero. That's what you can get out of this. However, the um, if you hold on to this, how much are you going to get out of it? Right now, this is what you would pay for it. If you hold on to it, you could get 78,000 bucks, right? It's got a face value of 78,000 bucks. So there's our 78,000. Divide by how much I'd have to pay to buy that right now, and that's going to end up giving me 0 0.1048 or 10.48 percent. 
Okay. What is the expected value of the debt? Well, uh, in good times, we're expected, or in, in the boom, we're expected to have 83,000 in cash flow. Will they be able to pay the full 78,000 in good in boom time? Yeah. And so 0 0.2 times the full 78,000. And then if things go terribly wrong, by the way, how do I get 0.8 here? Just one minus 0.2. If things go terribly wrong, um, they're only gonna get 61,000. They're not gonna get the full amount. And so if I do that math out, I see that it's $64,400 is the expected value of the debt. Now I ask, what is the expected, uh, the return on the expected value of the debt? 64,400 minus 70,600, because once again, that's what we're having to pay for this stuff. And so if I'm looking at the expected return on the bond, I'm looking at the expected payoff minus the market value divided by the market value. And that gives me negative 0 0.0878 or minus 8.78%. By the way, should you buy this debt at 70,600? Isn't it 83,000? Say again. Oh, the 83,000? 83,000 is great, but how much of it actually goes to the bondholders? Okay. 78. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful. Those uh, shareholders got 5,000 bucks in the good state, right? Great question. Here's what I want you to get. Why would anyone pay 70,600 for this? If you knew that the expected value of the debt was 64.4, that is the absolute most you would pay for it. And that's assuming that you are not risk averse. Most people would buy it only if it were 